Thank you for subscribing to One Mind Dharma's recorded talks. These are talks recorded in person or online from our meditation groups. You can visit us at www.onemindharma.com. That's O-N-E-M-I-N-D-D-H-A-R-M-A.com. And as always, you're welcome to email us at info at onemindharma.com with any questions or suggested topics uh, that you'd like us to speak about or elaborate upon. So today I thought I would talk about uh, the practice of letting go. Letting go is one of those things that we hear quite a bit. Uh, people tell us, you know, oh, just let go. If you let go, everything will be will be great. Whether it's, uh, you know, resentment or past pain or whatever it is. And uh, and I've and I've heard it quite a bit recently in my own life, and it's and it's a wonderful piece of advice. Um, but there's a little more to letting go than just letting go. I think that um, you know there are a lot of teachers, Dharma teachers that that recommend letting go. One of the most famous is Ajahn Chah. Was uh, he was a Thai Buddhist master, and one of his big teachings was to let go. He has a famous quote. Do everything with a mind that lets go. Do not accept praise or gain or anything else. If you let go a little, you will have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you will have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you will have complete peace. Which is inspiring to say the least, but it doesn't really tell us how to let go or what that looks like or what the hindrances to letting go may be. Um... And it's not and it's not to say that that quote or teaching is not wise. Rather, we must understand what it means and what the process of letting go is. A lot of us know that letting go is often um, the skillful thing to do, the kind thing to do, the, the wise thing to do. But how do we actually let go? So one of the first ways that comes to mind when we look at letting go is uh, letting go of pain. And for me, this comes up with memories or resentments, uh, you know, maybe past traumas, big or small things. But what happens is we kind of cultivate these resentments. We have these uh, ideas about, you know, our resentments and lack of forgiveness and specifically toward other people. And I've heard this quite a bit recently in my own life that let go of that resentment, let go of that uh, pain, which is again, a, a helpful piece of advice. But as far as my, my Buddhist path and practice, what does this look like, this letting go? Um, why do we not let go? And my experience has been both in my personal life and with working with others and teaching is that people hold on to pain uh, with the hope that, or maybe the sub unconscious hope that it'll protect them in the future. And I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, uh, there was some great harm caused to me by someone that was very dear to me. And I hold on to this resentment, um, and, I'm not real, and I wasn't really sure why for years and years. I went to tons of therapy. Um, I lived in a therapeutic boarding school when I was a, a teenager. Um, I've been to multiple drug rehabs where I worked on these issues. But really what it came down to was working with a meditation teacher in my meditation practice and seeing that these resentments give me a, a sense of safety in a way. It keeps me guarded. It keeps it from happening again, which is great in theory. But the truth really is that as we guard ourselves and don't let go, um, we're also closing the heart off to, to love and joy. Um, there's like that old idea that the more capacity we have for pain, the more capacity we also have for joy. And and letting go is a process of, of opening the heart, really. So with pain, you know, the biggest piece, I think, is looking at what is holding on to something offering you? Why do you hold on to something? George Haas, and I've, I think I've quoted this in this podcast and many of my teachings, George Haas, a teacher at Against the Stream and a student of Shins and Young's, says that the mind is hardwired for survival, not for happiness. The mind is hardwired for survival, not for happiness. When you think about that, the mind, not that it has it out for us, but it has our survival at interest. Sally Armstrong, a teacher at Spirit Rock, once said, 
your ancestors who heard something ruffle around in the bushes and didn't do anything, they're not your ancestors because they're dead. The people who were paranoid, who assumed it was a tiger, are the ones that stayed alive. So that's why our minds respond like this and hold on to things. And the human mind finds patterns. It's something beautiful that we're able to do, maybe not volitionally, volitionally all the time, but um, to find these patterns and to recognize them. And knowing that, we can use it um, skillfully for our awakening rather than our suffering. Because what happens is when we're caused harm, we close off like this, thinking it'll protect us, this kind of primal survival instinct and a conditioning that forgiveness is weak or that we should hold grudges. We shouldn't allow other people to treat us any certain way. So with pain, we can really look at what the holding on is offering us. What does it bring us that we're holding on to? In meditation practice, we often hold on to any thought that comes up. Uh, it can happen with other physical experiences the hearing experiences, um, but it most often happens with the thought process. Uh, we have a thought of anxiety and think, oh, I'm an anxious person. Maybe we don't think it overtly, but below the surface, we have the identity of an anxious person. A thought comes up and we kind of get attached to it rather than just letting it go and observing it. The idea of letting go comes into practice here, too. And that we have to let go. If we're to practice true mindfulness, we need to just observe. And when we don't just observe and we become attached, observing that. And letting go of the identity as someone who always gets attached. A big piece here is fixed views, which I'll get into in a moment. But in meditation practice, letting go is really one of the best tips that can be offered. And I think it's one of the reasons that teachers such as Ajahn Chah offered it uh, even pushed it a little bit is that we have to let go over and over again and letting go isn't necessarily something we do we decide to be people who are going to just let go and we let go forever um, you know it takes a consistent practice we have to just the same way we keep coming back to the breath we keep coming back to letting go when a thought arises um, we notice the clinging or the identity with it and just let go and I thought that I would just mention, too, that we often get attached to pleasure. And this is a whole other topic that, that could be discussed. But we most often notice the suffering or dukkha when it's related to unpleasant experiences. When we're really in an unpleasant moment and we're kind of averting or maybe even clinging to the unpleasantness. Um, that's when we notice the suffering. But there is dukkha or discomfort or unsatisfactoriness in clinging to uh, the pleasant experiences. I have a good example um, in my life. It was about a year ago now. I went on a 10-day meta retreat with my girlfriend at the time at Spirit Rock. And uh, about halfway through the retreat, or maybe day seven, I broke silence and uh, walked with my girlfriend up to her favorite spot on the ridge at, at Spirit Rock in Northern California. And I asked her to marry me. She said yes. We had, um, you know, our emotional moment. And then we went back into silence for a couple days, sitting with uh, Metta. For me, sitting with Metta for myself a lot, Metta for her. But really, more than anything, sitting with a mindfulness of the joy. And it was really beautiful to sit with this feeling of joy and excitement, trying to uh, remain equanimous, uh, which I didn't do very well with, but oh well. Um, and it was a really beautiful experience to uh, get engaged and then to sit with the joy for a couple days. Now, what happened when we left was um, I, of course, called my parents. She called her parents. They Everyone already knew. Um, not that she had said yes, but that I was going to ask her. But I called my parents. She called her parents. I called like my grandparents. Uh, she posted something on social media. And then our phones were just blowing up our inboxes, text messages, uh, you know, Facebook messages, everything. And what, what was like a calm and peaceful joy 
became excitement and exciting joy. And it wasn't any less uh, joyous. It wasn't any less um, pure or true. Uh, it was just a different, a different form of, a, of the feeling of joy, an excited form. And I immediately found myself thinking, we shouldn't have told anyone. Um, this isn't this isn't as pleasant having to answer all these text messages and phone calls. And we ended up shutting off our phones actually for a couple of days. But the point being that we get attached to the way things are when they're good, when they're pleasant. Um, and I use the term good, not that, you know, joy is inherently good. But when I find something as good, like, oh, my practice was solid. I was able to sit with true mindfulness of my joy. I was happy. So it was good. And then when it turned into excitement, it got a little stressful, which was bad. And, um, you know, I had a conscious, like a very volition, like a th the very clear thought, like, I wish I could just go back to retreat right now, um, which wasn't an option because the retreat had ended. And, uh, and the suffering around that of letting go of, you know what, those couple days were beautiful. Um, it was a, it was an interesting experience, both just to be on that kind of high the whole time, but also to investigate my joy and my relationship with joy. And, you know, of course, the mind that thinks you don't deserve this or, you know, whatever comes in the way of my joy. But, um, but really a practice in letting go when we have a joyous experience, being there and present for it. And then when it ends or it changes, which it will, letting go of it. And there's a lot of suffering around that that we often don't talk about. Um, we often focus on the suffering of the unpleasant stuff. But uh, I think it's important to mention how important letting go can be with the pleasant experiences. So a few tips on on letting go and these are just things that I found in my own practice whether it's a formal meditation practice or daily life it's all practice number one thing that helps me with letting go is is facing what's happening facing reality uh, I would say an acceptance or a knowing we can't really let go of the pain or the pleasure or the longing or the attachment if we don't know it's there and, and this is one of the biggest kind of obstacles in my own path is I, when I'm sitting, especially on retreats, I find myself like not doing well, kind of struggling and not really coming back to my practice very often, mind wandering, agitated. And what's going on is I have a longing or striving to like have a perfect practice. And when I recognize that that's happening, I'm able to see like, oh man, I really like all I want is to be a good meditator and have good meditations and be perfect and um, which is delusion and when I'm able to let go of that uh, I'm able to just be with what is I'm able to see those thoughts come up I'm able to see the praise and blame when I have a sit that is relatively concentrated and think the habit is to think oh I did well there the reality is is that we all have good sits bad sits whatever you want to call them when you really break it down, there's no such thing as a good sit or a bad sit. When we really break it down, we see that we have sits where the mind's more concentrated and we have sits where the mind is uh, running around or where we feel agitated. And there's many factors to this. What we ate and when we ate, how we slept last night, what the weather's like outside, where we're sitting. If, if you could be perfectly mindful, would you be? My, my answer is yes. When I'm sitting, especially on retreat, if I had the power to be perfectly mindful and perfectly concentrated and respond with kindness and compassion every time, I would be. But, I, but I'm not. So I can't accept the praise just as I can't accept the blame. It's not my fault that something's going wrong. However, it is my responsibility to tune in to what's happening in my experience. To face it, with some fearlessness and that's not to say that fear doesn't come up but to face it regardless of the fear um to to accept it and then to let it go or to let it be i would prefer to say we can observe what's happening without clinging to it this is the idea of not self in buddhism that the thoughts aren't our our, our identity and you can see this in periods of meditation most easily 
that a sound will come up or a thought will come up or a sensation in the body will come up. And neither, none of those experiences are ourselves completely. Um, they're just coming and going experiences. And as we practice with the three characteristics of existence, the not self and the dukkha and the impermanence, we begin to see that the changing nature of everything, the unsatisfactoriness of it, leads us to see that we are not our thoughts. For me in my daily life, this comes up. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a criminal history. I spent some time locked up. And it's really easy for me to identify, and I still do in my head sometimes as a criminal. And I kind of look for ways that the, you know, the confirmation bias. I look for ways to, to show that, like, oh, I'm just a criminal and people see me as that. You know, of course, most people don't know I'm a criminal because I don't walk around with a badge or anything. But uh, I know in myself that I've committed crimes, that, uh, you know, I've spent some time, I'm, you know, I've done everything right and I'm off probation and everything. But I know it in my, in my head and in my heart. So I perceive that other people treat me as it because I have a fixed identity. And, uh, you know, for example, my fiance and I are now moving and it's easy to be like, oh, they didn't want me because I'm a criminal. They ran a background check. And this fixed identity doesn't really serve me that well. It does in certain points. Um, you know, I'm able to speak with other people who have a criminal history and hopefully help them um, as I've come out the other end. But the fixed view mostly only causes me harm. It allows me to justify my experience and my behavior and see it through um, a very specific lens. It doesn't have to be something that dramatic. It can be, you know, I'm an anxious person. I'm a procrastinator. Um whatever it is, those are both true things of me, um, that I, that I get anxiety. I like to wait till the last minute to get things done. Well, I don't like to, I just do. But anyways, um, so to let go of these fixed views to, you know, it's good to know our habits and our patterns, but it's also good to know that in each moment we have an opportunity to build a new pattern, a new habit, um, a new kind of rut in the mind. So, for example, if you identify as like, I'm an angry person, I'm a person who just deals with anger, and you identify with that all the time in your head or even out loud, you may end up um, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy thing where you act in a way that confirms that bias you have in your head. For me, this is one of the problems I had with 12-step recovery, and, I, and I'm so grateful for everything I learned in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, and I still participate. But one of the problems I did have um, is having to say I'm an alcoholic every time I speak. Uh, I do think it's good to remember that I am a drug addict and I can't really use drugs or alcohol like a quote-unquote normal person. But I also think it's a little bit degrading to have to say that every time I speak. Um, that that's not all I am. I'm not just an alcoholic or drug addict. I'm not just uh, an ex-convict. I'm not just a meditation teacher. I'm not just, um, you know, a boyfriend or a son. That our identities and who we are are really fluid, all of us. We change identities many times throughout the day. If you're at work, you can see it when you talk to your boss versus your coworker. Or maybe you talk to your friends different than you talk to your grandmother. We kind of change, have these fluid identities, yet we fix to them in each moment. So for me, that's been a big practice of letting go. When we find ourselves thinking, oh, I'm an angry person or um, I'm anxious or I'm this or I am that, to stop there and really investigate the evidence behind that or why we're feeling like that. My experience has been that when I identify as that, it's often just kind of a cop-out justification for my behavior rather than really looking at what's going on within me. And with the example of anger, when I snap at someone or bark a little bit, I can really easily say like, oh, there's like, you know, I'm just an angry person versus actually taking the moment to look and see at what's what's going on. Is there some fear there? Is there some uh, aversion or maybe craving for things to be the way that I want them to be? And letting go of that idea that I am an angry person. I always will be an angry person. No, I had a moment where anger arose. That's it. So I think that when we look at letting go and when you look at letting go in your own life, 
and I, and I say this from my own experience, to try to find some ways that work for you to let go. And it can be done both in meditation practice and in daily life. In your meditation practice, try to bring special awareness to when you're clinging, when you're averting, when you're in those uh, three poisons, the clinging, the aversion, and the delusion. For me, I, I do a special sit quite frequently where I just notice kind of third foundation of mindfulness practice. What is the mental state right now? Am I in clinging or aversion? Am I in delusion? Is it some mix? And just kind of bring awareness to it over and over again, trusting that uh, as we bring awareness to it, we'll build that habit of bringing awareness to it and know how to respond better. And then in daily life, letting go of the identities that we have. As the resentments come up, letting go of the idea that we need to have a resentment of it, a resentment toward this person or toward this situation. For me, um, the best thing really has been looking at the fixed identity. When you act with anger or you have a moment of anxiety, what thoughts come up? So if you're someone who deals with sleepiness in meditation quite a bit, when you begin to get sleepy or after the meditation, tune in to what thoughts come up. Oh, I always get sleepy. I'm such an aversive type or I'm so tired. Just really tune into the actual experience. For me, I am a person that responds with anger. So, you know, not always, but my fear or my unpleasantness comes up as anger. For other people, it may come up as anxiety, but I know this about myself and I don't cling to that identity. I know that I don't have to respond that way. I don't have to respond by cultivating a resentment. I can respond today um, by letting go and responding with some wisdom, some mindfulness some metta, some compassion for myself or another, some forgiveness, and, uh, and really let go and allow things to be more fluid than the unconscious mind tries to make them be. Thank you all for listening. As always, you're welcome to email us at info at onemindharma.com with any questions or thoughts or, again, any topics that you'd like us to, to cover. Uh, we look forward to sitting with you next week, and uh, we'll see you all then.